Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining me this beautiful Thursday evening. It's 7 o'clock over here on the East Coast. Uh, welcome to another Thursday webinar. This time, we got some great news, very exciting, um, about 10.3 and its release. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, uh, updates so far uh, of the software, and um, it's it's been going great so far. I had a lot of great uh, great feedback from our folks out in the field. Um, so without further ado, this is introduction to AVI OS 10.3. I'm joined, of course, by uh, Tom Harper, the Director of Marketing, and my boss. Um, I'm also joined by Will Reichert over in Pilot and IFD Support, and Frank Utter, the Tech Support Training Lead. Those guys are going to be fielding your questions in the chat. A couple things of note, um, make sure that your speakers are on and that you can hear me. Uh, there will be a Q&A at the end, and of course, this webinar is being recorded. So um, if I miss your question or if you miss something, you can always refer back. We're going to have uh, webinar replays um, of this and all of our other webinars in the future, and uh, those will be available on avidine.com. They'll be available on our dealer portal for our dealers that are tuning in, and they're also going to be thrown up on our YouTube channel. So make sure you check those out. So reason why everybody's here, of course, uh, 10.3 is here. Um, it did get approved last Friday. I had to go the entire weekend without telling everybody how excited we were that it was approved, that we had to wait till this week, but it is in fact out. We had to let our dealers know to get them uh, ready to go and, and uh, <clears throat> ready for, for all the software updates, but it is here and we are very excited that it is here and it's uh, certified and I can't wait to tell you guys all about it. 10.3 was engineered based on all of your feedback and suggestions. We took a lot of that feedback and suggestions from our Avidyne Live Forum, from the Avidyne's uh, Pilots Club, um, a, a couple other places, face-to-face -face stuff at Sun and Fun and Oshkosh and all the trade shows out there where we get to see you guys and we compile all that stuff. And 10.3 uh, is, is definitely one of those software updates where much of your suggestions made it into 10.3. So what I'm gonna be going over today is uh, first uh, a whole bunch of new training material. Uh, we've got updated pilot guides, updated quick reference guides. Uh, we've, we've got uh, a bunch of, of new training material that we're gonna be going over telling you about how to get it, how to download it, where to buy it, things like that. I'm gonna be talking about the, uh, the overview of the software, kind of a higher level overview. Um, and, and a lot of the improvements that we did. Uh, I'm gonna get into the new setup menu. Things are gonna look pretty different in the setup menu. Um, so I'll be talking about that. I'll go over how to get the software. Uh, hundreds of you already have downloaded the software and have requested it from us. And um, so for those that haven't, I'm gonna tell you how to do that. Uh, a couple little tips and tricks on, on how to safely get that onto a thumb drive and ready to slap into your IFD. Um, how to get it if you are uh, running a certified aircraft, uh, whether it be dealer or non-dealer. Um, what to do if you are an experimental owner with a builder certificate uh, doing your own uh, upgrades. And of course, our, our various training resources and we will do a Q&A at the end. So a couple of things about the new training material that we have uh, for the folks doing the installs and in our dealers, we do have an interactive installation manual update that is now revision 24. Uh, that is available on the dealer portal. And then uh, uh, you can request it uh, via email uh, for that. We've got some new pilot guides out there. Um, first and foremost, the pilot guide is available for PDF download. Uh, it will be available on avidine.com. Uh, it is available up on the dealer portal. Uh, until we get it up on avidine.com, you can go ahead and just uh, reach out to us and, and we'll hand it out to you. Also, you don't even need to do that because the link that we sent out for everybody to request the software does have the pilot guide on it there under the attachments section. So go back to that link if you don't already have the pilot guide, uh, download it. It's a uh, free PDF. Throw it on your computer and have that there for reference. We also do have hard copies available for purchase. So I'll get into that later and where you can get those at. Quick reference guides, again, same thing. Free PDF download uh, will be on avidine.com. It is in that link that we sent out. You can download it from there and we'll have hard copies available for purchase there. We also have the new uh, 10.3, the version three of the Michael Bauer book, Flying with the Avidine IFD. Again, available for purchase. Um, we we will be uh, uh, making that available for download as well. 
keep an eye out guys for new webinars, new knowledge base articles and training videos as we go along. Um, we'll be working on that, uh, revamping our training videos, coming up with all kinds of new webinars as we really get into the weeds with uh, specific features and functionality of your new software and of course all the new knowledge base articles that we'll be coming out with that you can reference on avidine.com under the pilot support tab at the top. So a little bit about our interactive IAM revision 24 uh, which is available on the dealer portal. Um, Avidine it was the first in general aviation to come out with an interactive installation manual. Uh, truly is a it, it's an amazing um, uh, work from from our team over in tech support they spent a lot of time compiling all this information together uh, to to make this interactive training manual you'll see a lot of these links in the train in, in the im that have some of these videos that link to to more in-depth training videos a uh, little bit about interfaces and uh, configurations and, and little tips and tricks that uh, uh, that we have for you guys and your installers one thing that i do want to make make mention of um, I, I put this blurb here from 14 CFR Part 4313A, which talks about any time that you're performing maintenance alteration, preventative maintenance, make sure that you are using the current manufacturer's maintenance manual or the ICA. Um, you do have the ICA in that download. You need that. Um, if you are downloading 10.3, the, uh, having the ICA in the aircraft, we've, we've got the current version available uh, to you. That's something you as, as an owner need to have in your uh, in your uh, paperwork for the aircraft, and then of course, you know, you if 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 you're qualified to do so and you are performing maintenance on that aircraft, you need to make sure that you've got the current maintenance manual. In this case, right now, as this webinar is being recorded, it is revision 24, um, and there is no substitute uh, to those documents when it comes to performing maintenance uh, for the or at least with the IFD. So. Uh, New training material again, we got new pilot guides. Um, those are gonna be shipped with new IFD purchases in the pilot welcome kit. Um, you know, when you buy your IFD, you get that nice leather case. It's got all that paperwork in it. The pilot guides come with that. Well, we have an updated pilot guide. We do have those available for free PDF download. Again, they're in that link that we sent out and we do have some hard copies available uh, on Amazon. So how we're gonna do that now is um, uh, if, if you need an updated pilot guide, there's a couple ways to do it. If you want a hard copy, uh, those are available on Amazon in both a, a hard cover version, or I'm sorry, a paperback version and uh, Amazon Kindle uh, version as well. So you've got uh, a range of options there for obtaining that information um, in a couple different ways. Quick reference guide, same thing. Not as big as the pilot guide, so uh, it, it's a little cheaper in price when it comes to the hard copy and the Kindle versions. Again, all those are available on Amazon free PDF on avidine.com in that link that we sent out, and it is in the knowledge base article. Uh, there is a five series and four series versions. Uh, and what we did was we went ahead and we added the IFD 100 setup instructions in the quick reference guide. And that's in the very back, back of that quick reference guide. So check that out, uh, learn it, read it, and um, learn all about your IFD. Flying with the Avidine IFD third edition, is out it is available on amazon for 44.95 uh, the kindle version is available uh, for 9.99 and we are working on a a free pdf version available for that as well the third edition covers all of the changes in 10.3 the lessons are going to be very familiar to you uh, what changed in the third edition is going to be the aux menu and a couple other things you know we, we introduce visual approaches and things like that so we're going to be talking about a lot of those things in the third edition book uh we are not at this time going to be giving out the third edition book um this is how we're going to be rolling this out uh for the meantime so um that's what we've got with the third edition of the bauer book Okay, so moving into the software, getting into an overview of what's changed and all the improvements with 10.3. Uh, this is how we're gonna be presenting this to you tonight in this webinar. We're gonna go over FMS features and improvements, the map and synthetic vision, a uh, couple new things with the user interface, data link, uh, new external interfaces, which I know a lot of you are excited about and a lot of you guys have a ton of questions about. 
uh, the new TSO TAWS and H TAWS that is now available in the IFDs, and then a couple of maintenance mode improvements. So jumping right into it, into the FMS features and improvements, a lot of you guys were asking about uh, visual approaches. So that is part of 10.3. We've included it in, into, um, into the software. What that is going to look like and essentially how that's going to work is, well, first off, it's going to be available for all runways at all airports that are in the Jeppesen database, including those airports that don't have instrument procedures. Um, how that does work is that the runway has to have a defined threshold position and elevation, which chances are if it's in the, the Jeppesen database, it's already there. So um, if you're trying to add an airport that's not, maybe you got a private strip that's not yet in the Jeppesen database, you're not going to be able to set up a visual approach into that um, because it doesn't have that defined threshold and elevation. But if it's in there, it should be good to go. What that does is it provides a single leg aligned with the runway or an, ex or an extended um, center line. And that's going to be your final, and that's what's going to be the, the guided leg. That, that final leg is what we're going to have lateral and vertical guidance on. The depiction of the traffic pattern in there is, is really going to be kind of a reference thing. It's not going to be coupled in a pattern. You can't enter a downwind and couple your autopilot, and it'll fly your downwind, your base, and your final. Uh, but it will fly that down on a final leg, and that will end a tenth of a mile before the runway threshold and you enter it just like any instrument approach. With that transition for pattern entry, your, your left base, right base, left downwind, right downwind, straight in, all of those visual entries are gonna be available to you as you're building your flight plan. Now there's a little bit more to it as, as we get along, but like I said, there's gonna be a future webinar where we really, really get into the weeds on this. By the way, visual approaches are, are selectable, right? Um, you, can, you can turn those off to not make them a selection in your flight plan, uh, but it's certainly available to you there. You'll be able to change a, a, a bunch of different parameters, your, your uh, final entry length, your pattern width, things like that, and your, uh, your, your descent angle as well. So more to follow on that. It is really important to note though that with visual approaches, you're gonna have that customizable descent angle in your FMS setup, and that's gonna be per user, that's going to be, between one and six degrees that you can set in 0.1 degree increments. But the, the important thing that I wanna note here is that your visual entries, your straight in, left base, right base, and your downwinds are always going to be available. So it is important that if you are setting up a visual approach, make sure that you are familiar with the airport facilities diagram, like you should always be, um, with how you are allowed to enter that traffic pattern for that particular airport. So just keep that in mind. So next up, we're talking about uh, advisory VNAV. That's another thing that, that people were asking about. All right, so I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on this when I talk about uh, VNAV, because there's a little bit of confusion out there on, on how that works. So the VDI, which is your vertical descent indication, is only going to show on 550, in, in, in terms of the IFDs, the 550 and the 545 boxes. Well, why is that, Mike? Well, I, I, it's easy, because that has the FMS tab in it, right? Um, the VNAV does require a barrow altitude input, of course, because your altitude constraints are all based on barrow altitude inputs, right? It'll give you advisory vertical guidance uh, in those descents, but you have to be above the target constraint altitude to get your vertical descent. Um, those deviations are going to show on your SVS page with the VDI uh, with some normal and vertical direct to um, uh, line select keys there. And you see that we have added the vertical direct to indication uh, as, a, as a selectable uh, line select key there. So that is how that is going to look. Now, um, some people may ask, you know, hey, can I get this on a, a four series box? Hey, you can. Um, you can do that if, let's say, you've got a G5 because the G5 is gonna show the, the vertical um, deviation. So that's, that's certainly something that's going to work. Um, some other ones won't because that takes a certain label uh, for that. So uh, there's, there's a few limitations, but um, for the most part, if you've got a 550, um, you should be good to go there with what the IFD is going to show. Uh, and then again, if you've got a G5 hooked up to an IFD, um, you're going to be able to do the same thing, so it should be should be all right. Uh, just another idea of what that's going to look like. So on your SVS page, um, I don't know if you can see my my mouse cursor, but on the right side here, there's our VDI with the VNAV in magenta. 
letting you know that this is in fact a VNAV um, uh, uh, segment. All right, we are descending down to the altitude constraint that we have set here. For ex for example, CMK, we've got that set with the 9,000 foot constraint and uh, we are heading on down to it. So that's kind of what it's gonna look like. Any questions about that, um, go ahead and, and get into the uh, pilot guide and the quick reference guide that'll explain a couple of things there. Uh, here's another feature that, that is really cool, the oral alert for waypoint passage. Now this is a feature that a lot of our folks that are in our Avidine Live forum had asked about and we were able to make that happen. So what's gonna work is in your setup page, if you go to the, um, under the alerts page, there's gonna be a selection now for waypoint oral and you can toggle that on and off. When you have it set to on, anytime that you cross a waypoint, you're gonna get a, a voice call out that says waypoint. If you're coming across the final approach fix, you're going to get a call out that says final approach. Um, so if you've got the uh, audio uh, piped in from the IFD into your audio panel for those, uh, you'll be able to hear those coming through. So really, really neat feature there. I did see the question in the chat, Brian. I'm, I'm taking a look. Uh, do I mean the 540 or is there now a 545? There always was a 545. That is one of the six. There are six different models. The 545 is uh, it's a GPS with SBS with no uh, VHF comp. That's, that's the IFD 545. Um, moving along, support for oceanic mode. So what that does is when you're more than 200 nautical miles from any airport, most places you're over an ocean, um, the full scale deflection moves to four nautical miles on the CDI. And we're gonna be able to show that on the data block. Of course, it'll change the CDI deflection externally. And you'll be able to view that on the GPS status page under nav mode. You'll be able to see that you are in oceanic mode. So those with those two will look like. Uh, we added between as an altitude constraint. What does that mean? Um, when you're in your flight plan and you you change your uh, altitude constraints. Normally it was at or below, at, at or above. Well, we've added between what that does. It's a block altitude, right? You set a block altitude, you can set those two altitudes. So we did add that feature. Uh, added a digital OBS readout for the top data block. Now, previously when you threw it into uh, uh, OBS or, or uh, VLOG mode, you would see I'm sorry, OBS mode, you would just see uh, the, the mode selector, you would just see OBS. Well, in this case, now um, the selected course is gonna display next to that, next to that CDI source uh, when you throw it in OBS mode. The selected course, while it's being modified, is gonna show up on the map, so the magenta line is gonna start moving around. You're gonna see your numbers change. Uh, so the display of the OBS setting, when you control it by the OBS knob, uh, on the remote HSI or CDI. So you're gonna see that as well. Um, OBS selected course control IFDs without a radio. So for those IFDs without a radio, again, the IFD 545, the 510 and the 410, um, you don't have that knob on the top right. So we use that on the, the bottom right uh, in, in those various pages. So if you've got one of those that instead of that being, being up there where you change it, it's on the bottom right. Uh, moving into map and SBS features and improvements, we did add the power line database, right? So we'll be able to show power lines. What does that look like? Right here. So that's a graphical representation of, of the power lines and the towers that are in the area. Uh, and we can actually uh, play around with that map layer. So we can toggle it on or off um, under your power line selection in, in uh, I'm still calling it user options. It's the, uh, the setup menu. Uh, we can toggle uh, when that shows up, uh, when you zoom in on your map, when that that uh, layer shows up, and then also based on uh, AGL height of the aircraft, we can we can uh, filter that that layer out. We did increase the map zoom by a bit, uh, so now we've increased the zoom. You can zoom all the way down to half a nautical mile for the outer ring, quarter not quarter mile for the inner ring. Um, really cool feature for guys that are running search and rescue, fire patrol, helicopters, something that they requested and we were able to do that. Uh, allowing for chart displays to follow the own ship when zoomed in. So previously when you had your chart tab, uh, the aircraft would move over the map instead of the 
chart moving underneath a center fixed aircraft icon. Well, now we've done that, right? So we've taken those, that, that, that's gotten a lot of feedback from customers, both on Facebook and on Avidine Live. So now what's gonna happen is the chart is displayed moving underneath that plane instead of the plane moving across the chart and your plane going off of the screen. So everything moves underneath and your, your aircraft is fixed under there. Here's another big one is we can turn off the charts tab if we're not updated or subscribed to a chart database uh, with uh, with Jeppesen. So the way that's done is in the main system config page in maintenance mode, we can enable or disable charts. Um, and once you go back into flight mode and you go back to your map page, you'll see that that chart tab is no longer there. So folks that don't subscribe to a Jepson database, uh, chart database or they don't want to. Uh, they just like having a bigger screen, but they get their charts elsewhere. Uh, very beneficial for them. They won't get the expired charts message uh, anymore. They can just shut it off. Uh, three arc second terrain and water databases. So this is one, one feature that we're really excited about is uh, we there is a hardware modification that is available uh, as an upgrade where you will get a much, much clearer uh, terrain database. We're calling that three arc second HD terrain. Um, it is an optional upgrade and we do offer that for, uh, it's a $3,000 upgrade and it requires you to bring the IFD back, we'll modify it. Um, but it is one of those options and I'll talk about this later though when I talk about certified uh, TSO TAWS and HTAWS. Um, if you do purchase TAWS and HTAWS, the three arc second HD terrain upgrade is included with that purchase. So uh, moving along, kind of take a look at what it looks like here. So on the left side, we have our existing nine arc second terrain, which is what you're familiar with seeing on the IFDs, both four and five series. The paid option for the three arc second HD terrain is on the right. So you can clearly see there's a big difference between left and right, nine arc second and three arc second. Now this is available on five series and four series boxes. Here's another view of kind of what that looks like. Again, nine arc second terrain on the left, three arc second HD terrain on the right. So a really, really cool feature. All right, so moving into the user interface features and improvements. Again, I talked about a new uh, auxiliary setup page. Uh, I still call it user options, it's okay. Um, what we did here was we completely redesigned it, right? So uh, it's not that it looks different from, from anything else in your, uh, your IFD, it just kind of looks like everything else in your IFD, right? So it's, it's more of a streamlined design with the FMS style rows. All the categories there um, are grouped into related settings. Um, what that means is you've got all these categories for you know alerts, FMS, data, connectivity, things like that are all going to be there uh, in your menu. Uh, some of those categories are shown or hidden based on the IFD configuration. Uh, so depending on um, if you've got uh, a, a wireless setup in there or, or something like that. Um, they'll either not be there, or they will, just to kind of keep it decluttered as best as we can. It uses that familiar plus and minus icons for expanding and contracting each of those categories. And you'll see what I mean here in just a second. But some real key feature changes about that is we eliminated the separate pages for your data block map, FMS, and user options. So when we would tell you, hey, you know, check out, uh, check out your, um, setup page and then hits it the hit the line select key to toggle that until it says you know uh, setup map or setup fms that's that's gone it's all on one page um so we've, we've cleaned it up that way so that means that the knob operation is real consistent with the rest of the system with a push to push twist push whereas in user options back in 10261 you would go down to user options you'd use the right knob to scroll down and then You'd use the inner knob to change your selection, but that didn't match the rest of the system. So now everything is streamlined with the IFD and it's, it uses that, that same interface on all of the pages. We were able to in, improve the Wi-Fi configuration. Um, so how that works is that, that's, a, that's a really big change. Um, the cool thing about this is instead of going down to your networking selection and then selecting the SSID, you're basically gonna connect just like you would uh, uh, computers and iPads in your house. I'll show you what I mean in a minute. 
Um, the hotspot name is based off of your IFD serial number, so it's no longer Leo Wi-Fi. It is IFD underscore your aircraft or your IFD serial number, uh, but you can also change that and you can change the password as well. And all that can be done in flight mode now. So there's no going into maintenance mode to change the SSID, to mess around with passwords and things like that. Everything can be done with flight mode. And then we did include a method for allowing and blocking certain connected devices too. And uh, we'll show you why that's important here in just a second. But the first thing I wanna talk about is the setup page, what that looks like. You can see the boxes with the plus in it. If you hit that plus, you're gonna see the expanded menu. You'll see the minus uh, come up there and then all the other options that are available down underneath alerts, charts, connectivity, data blocks, et cetera. So it's all one page. We're not going into a separate different page. Everything is laid out here. It's nice and neat and everything is grouped and organized uh, in this manner. This is what your new networking section is going to look like. So you can see here that we have uh, IFD hotspot, which is going to be your Leo Wi-Fi or your host network for the IFD. We've renamed it, it's IFD underscore serial number of your IFD. And of course, under where it says network name, that's where you would change it if you wanted to change it. The password is there if you wanted to change the password. Um, and then ADSB over Wi-Fi, we can toggle that on and off uh, there. And then let's say that we had, uh, we were turning on a Stratus 3 or a level bomb or, or one of those, um, uh, external third-party wireless devices, once we have that on, the IFD is going to see that and that's going to show up under this networks section. So, you know, let's say you've got your phone set up as a hotspot, you got a Century 3, you turn all that stuff on and maybe your hangar Wi-Fi, you would likely see that show up here. All of the available networks that you can then connect to are going to show up right here. Um, another thing is going to be connection requests. So uh, each device that you connect to that's recognized by the IFD, uh, mostly iPads, things like that, are going to be represented by uh, a device item that's shown under the device's subcategory. In this case, if I named my iPad Cockpit iPad, it's going to see that device as Cockpit iPad. Now, when you do see this and you connect your iPad to your IFD for the first time after upgrading to 10.3, you're going to get that connection request. It's a, it's a bright green it looks like a cast message on the bottom right, and that's letting you know, hey, go down to your devices section, find that thing, and then change one of those modes. It's going to revert, it's going to default to blocked because that requires an action on your part to either set that to um, never, once, or always, depending on how I want it to connect. So. Uh, in most cases, it's just me and my plane. I've got a single IFD, a single iPad. I upgrade to 10.3 and I connect everything over to the first time. When I make that iPad connection, I'm gonna get a connection request for my iPad. I'm gonna go down to my devices, I'm gonna find it and I'm gonna set that guy to always because if I'm getting ready to go fly, I want my iPad to connect to my IFD every single time. So I'll set that to always. Well, if the kids have an iPad in the back and we're going flying and I don't want them to connect to the IFD, um, I can set that up and I can block it so that it it never hooks up, all right? Or if I'm flying with a friend, uh, I can set that to uh, once, right? So I can set it up so so the next time it'll it'll block and then I have to allow it the next time. Uh, so that's kind of how that would work. And then never, what that means is it'll obviously just never never hook up uh, to that iPad until you go and, and change it again manually. Okay, so we also added uh, 10 user profiles. Before we had five, uh, this is a request that was made by flight schools and fleets that have uh, multiple uh, pilots flying the same aircraft. Um, usually more than five, they wanted some different user profiles. You know, each pilot was different. They liked a, a particular setup. So we allowed up to 10. Um, but what we were able to do with that is, only the user profiles that you have set up are going to be available when you toggle the line select key on the left side. So in this case, I've got pilots Larry, Curley, and Mo. 
I, if I toggle that line select key on the left, the only, the only options that are going to be available to me are Larry Curly Mo. If I hit it again, it'll go Larry Curly Mo, Larry Curly Mo, until I set up username four, uh, to which case uh, that one would pop up as I'm toggling that line select key. So it, it actually works out better than the previous version to where you're toggling through five user options, whether or not they were set up. Um, you're only going to have to toggle through the ones that you had set up. So there's no scrolling through all 10. Uh, we do have a new weight calculator um, in the utilities page, right? So how we did that was um, in your main system config page, if you've already upgraded to 10.3, you've probably seen this, I hope you have, um, where we've added the, the weight calculator, we've added a selection for RF legs, our en route VNAV, and a couple other selections here. But specifically talking about the weight calculator, what we did here was we have added a block to set your basic empty weight, your max takeoff weight, and your max landing weight in maintenance mode. How that works is it computes the current aircraft weight using the basic empty weight, and all of the other weights that you've that you've manually entered, your passengers, baggage, and fuel, uh, that fuel weight is going to be provided by the fuel planning calculator. And the cool thing about that is, if there is an exceedance, it's going to turn that uh, yellow, and it will compute your landing weight from your current weight and the fuel at destination. Like, say you've got a flight plane, you're sitting on the ground, you've activated it, you go to your util page and you see, okay, what's my uh, landing weight going to be when I land. Okay, I may be too heavy or something like that. So you can you can get a, a much better representation of all of your weight calculations here uh, with all of that. Now, the cool thing for our multi-engine folks is it will also calculate V1, V2, VR, and VREF, uh, but that is reference only. Um, speaking of our multi-engine friends, we do have new left and right fuel flow numbers for twin aircraft. So if you've got a multi, if you got, if you have it set up in maintenance mode for multi-engine, um, and you do have a fuel totalizer like a EDM 930 or or any one of those uh, engine monitors that'll handle uh, a twin-engine aircraft, uh, that's that's piping in that information to the IFD, you'll see uh, left and right fuel flow and fuel used. Um, calculations on there. So uh, again, that was another feature that was real big for Facebook and, and Avidine Live that we were able to uh, to bring out. Uh, we've also added a canard type own ship model in maintenance mode. So that's a selectable thing. Uh, maybe you don't you don't like the uh, aircraft symbol that we have and you want to uh, throw a canard up there, you can certainly do that now. So that was a fun little thing that uh, that somebody on Facebook had asked about and it, we were pretty easy to it was pretty easy to implement that. Another one is the ability to cross side or tune your cross side and your tandem VHF radios for front seat, back seat. You can even do this with a uh, with a stack. But basically, what that allows you to do is be able to, to uh, tune your number one IFD over cross sync from your second IFD, and vice versa. Um, you can set the volume and squelch for the other IFD from the other IFD. Um, which is a really neat feature. Really, really cool for aircraft that have uh, tandem configurations and they have an IFD in each cockpit. Um, are the folks with stacks going to use it very much? Probably not. Uh, I think the guys that are that are running tandem aircraft, though, I, are absolutely going to use this, um, especially if they have a, a, a co-pilot with them. A couple of really cool features about that. You're going to see your station IDs represented as a comm one, COM2, NAV1, NAV2, and those are going to show up in yellow. So it's really easy to see uh, what you're tuning if it belongs to the standby or active in your IFD or if it's uh, your, your co-pilot's IFD, if you're in one of those tandem configurations. Again, I don't think folks that are running uh, uh, standard stacks are going to be using this too much, but it's going to be a great feature for those tandem aircraft. So another, another example here. Um, You've got remote IFD tuning enabled uh, in your stack. That COM1 is going to be prepended to the frequency IDs. What I mean by prepended is you're going to see COM1 dash and then the station readout. Uh, and you're going to see that for your COM and your NAV. All right, a couple different things that you can do with that. So that's what it's going to look like. Uh, again, you can change your uh, active and standby COM and your side tone and, and a couple different things. You can toggle squelch with, with those as well uh, for the other IFD. So neat feature for our tandem folks. 
Um, some other VHF and frequency features and improvements that we've added with 10.3 is a frequency list 10 second timeout. And that's really for our 440 guys. So if you if you scroll that bottom left knob on your 440 and you're gonna see your uh, your frequency list pop up. Well, if you don't do anything after 10 seconds, it's going to go away. Okay. Uh, of course, you can always, uh, th there, there's other ways to do that, right? You can enter a frequency, you can hit X on the top right. Uh, but if you tune your frequency and you don't do anything, uh, 10 seconds later, it'll go away uh, automatically. So uh, we did improve the side tone volume setting when the squelch is toggled. Um, so kind of made that a little bit more pleasant as, as you're doing that. Improved the frequency list bug that allowed the entry of invalid 8.33 frequencies. Uh, we, we were able to, uh, to improve that. And then uh, holding the frequency swap button on the Bluetooth keyboard to set the guard frequency. We weren't able to do that previously. So if you guys have a Bluetooth keyboard that you fly with on a, on a regular basis, you got the Mark 10 that came with your IFD. Um, previously, you hold the frequency swap button and it wouldn't set guard. Well, now you hold it down and it will set guard that 121.5 in, uh, in your IFD. So neat feature there. Uh, moving on right along, displaying the unit serial number on your system page. I did allude to that uh, previously when I was talking about your new Leo Wi-Fi uh, SSID or the name there. We did that, but we also put your serial number on your uh, system page, all right? It's gonna be on your, your software status in the system tab. Uh, previously, uh, you had to go back into maintenance mode, get the serial number or only find it on the side of the uh, side of the box if, if you just saw, saw having to be taking it out of the uh, out of the panel. Now it's it's right there in flight mode, so it's really really easy to get, and it will show up in um, as your SSID for your wireless stuff. Some other data link features that we added for this, uh, some support for some additional ADSB weather products that you that you weren't able to show previously, uh, we were able to show there. Um, added compliance of TSO C157B, and a uh, couple big ones here: ADSB from portable devices that we're able to show and some FISB TSO compliance. So moving into that, I'm gonna start talking about the, uh, the data link products. So we were able to add cloud tops, icing, lightning, and turbulence as layers in your map. Again, you go to the weather overlay and you can toggle those. You can select regional weather radar. Uh, and now we've added these other layers, right? So our cloud tops here, we can add icing, lightning, and turbulence. What those are gonna look like here, and a couple of things that, that we've added in your system page and your data link status page, you will see that in 10.3 that the legend is much bigger now because we've added those other products. So you'll be scrolling down and looking and seeing kind of what each of those means. And then on the right side, just some examples of turbulence, icing, and lightning. Next slide here has got uh, just a, a zoomed in view of kind of what that looks like. And just like any of those weather layers, if you have one of those layers pulled up in your in your map tab, use that uh, the lower right knob uh, to either zoom in and out on the map as part of hybrid touch, but the smaller knob is going to change those flight levels. So in this example, we're looking at turbulence at flight level 140. Um, so we'll be able to toggle that as well. So turbulence on the left, icing on the right, and then this is uh, what lightning is going to look like. So it's going to show those lightning strikes, and that's going to be fizz, that's a FISB product. That's that's ADSR um, uh, from the ground station. So we'll see that. A couple of other uh, data link things that we fixed. So previously we got the uh, data link data not received message. It was it was a nuisance message. What that data link data not received message meant was there was a a product in that broadcast from the ground station uh, that the IFD wasn't seeing. Um, most cases it was air meds or sig meds on a beautiful day. Um, an IFD would tell you, hey, I'm not, I'm not getting this thing. So what it's gonna do now is it's gonna say overdue, but it's gonna reduce the amount of times that you see that message. You know, previously I think it was every 15 minutes that we would get that in flight. A lot of times we would be uh, cranking up, doing our ground run, and before we ever even take off, we see a data link data not received. Well, that's because we, you know, we were out of view of the ground station and we just weren't getting it. So now instead what it, what it does is now it just says that it's overdue. You can go to the data link status page and see what is overdue or what's not being received. But what it's not gonna do now is it's not gonna list individual late products on your alerts tab. It's gonna say, hey, go see the data link status page. But that's gonna be kind of a one and done thing. It's gonna delete as soon as you acknowledge that cast message. And that way, that's you're not going to get that nuisance nuisance message anymore. 
Um, we did add TSO TAWS uh, for the IFD and the Atlas. That's going to be TAWS and HTAWS. We added more voice callouts that you can enable or disable. So initially it was, or originally it was just the 500 foot callout. Now we've added a thousand foot and then 500 all the way down to a hundred that you can enable or disable yourself based on what you want to hear. Uh, TAWS is TSO'd. It is a, an optional upgrade. And the price for that is seventy nine ninety nine. Um, that does include that free three arc second. Uh, that that does include the three arc second HD terrain that we talked about previously. So if you go buy the Taws upgrade, uh, that does include that three arc second HD terrain. That box is going to have to come back for that because it is a hardware modification. Um, but that is a feature of Taws if you need Taws. Uh, a little bit more about that. Um, how that's going to look. Um, in those IFDs, your SBS tab that, that was part of your map system uh, is going to be renamed to TAWS. It's no longer SBS if you do have the TAWS enablement. Uh, you've probably seen this at some of our shows uh, where the SBS tab is gone and we see a TAWS page. Uh, that's because what it's showing you is all those TAWS products. Uh, important to note that fixed wing TAWS is only available on five series boxes. Well, why is that? It has to do with the available outputs on a five series versus a four series. So there is no TAWS on four series boxes. Not to worry guys, unless you need TAWS, you still have all the great features of our FLTA, which is included in all of the IFD. So FLTA hasn't gone away. Uh, we did just get TSO TAWS. So for the folks that have operational requirements for TAWS, or maybe they just want TAWS, they can certainly do that and get all those TAWS features. But FLTA is very much still there uh, for everybody else. It will give you terrain warnings and orals and user configurable callouts. It's going to look a lot like what you have seen previously with your uh, with the the uh, terrain warning and the FLTA um, that that you're used to, but just a, a couple other things, a couple other uh, messages. You can see on the uh, the the HTAWS here. You can see the terrain uh, enunciation here um, as as part of that TAWS upgrade. So. Some of the features that we brought in for fixed wing TAWS, um, a, a few more alerts, uh, oral alerts that are gonna be showing up um, for excessive descent rate, negative climb rate, premature descent alerts are gonna be available uh, for the uh, IFDs for TAWS. And then again, those are your alerts that are gonna show up on the right with your, uh, your oral alerting as well. Uh, for TAWS, H TAWS and the F500, which is that uh, the 500 foot call out, you know, we do have the FLTA algorithm, which is still is still pumping out um, all those alerts that you're used to seeing. Uh, but now that's going to be that that was that's rolled into TAWS, of course, uh, as as part of the TSO. Uh, but then again, you got more of those altitude callouts. We had the 500, um, but now we've added those thousand and then 500 down to 100 or alerts for those as well. Um, so if you're confused about what uh, what goes with what, what I can do. Uh, both IFDs 4 and 5 series have the ability for the 3 arc second HD terrain upgrade. Um, if you do purchase the TAWS option, the 3 arc second HD terrain is included in that. Uh, and it is the 5 series uh, that does fixed wing TAWS only. Both the 5 and the 4 can do H TAWS or helicopter TAWS. So moving along, uh, this is a big one, folks. So external interfaces, I know a lot of you guys were asking about this. Uh, what did we add in 10.3? What can I do now? Um, yes, we can certainly say that the GI275 is an approved interface with the IFDs, and that is going to be, um, our installation manual is going to be the approval document for that uh, interface with the GI275. So your installers no longer have to do field approvals for that. Um, they can just reference the installation manual. Uh, what that's going to look like, uh, figure D70 in the IM, revision 24, uh, there it is, right? Pretty cut and dry, just a couple of, of uh, Aaron 429 connections, uh, an RS-232, and uh, that's basically it. So we got some configurations there, some, some uh, recommended configs uh, for that interface, and that's all in the new interactive installation manual. We are also... Uh, 
good to go to be the position source for the GDL88. Previously, you needed uh, a GDL88 that could produce its own GPS position source or had to get it from somewhere else. Uh, now we no longer have to worry about that. We can now send it um, a GPS position. So a couple of things were tweaked. We were able to make that happen uh, and we were able to get that approval for the GDL88 customers out there. Radar altimeter support was another one. So now what we can do is we can take a radar altimeter and uh, pump it in over errant 429 and we'll show that on a data block we'll be able to show radar altimeter so uh, i'm an old helicopter guy and i know uh, a lot of our helicopter customers out there are excited about this but we can now show that as a uh, as a configurable data block on the ifd and of course we can display weather and traffic on the ifd from a portable adsb device the Stratus 3, the Stratux, and the Bomb are just three examples of what you can do. Um, there, there is uh, a, a list of ones that don't. Basically, how that's going to work uh, is we're going to connect that up just like we normally do. There's a couple other things that I'm going to show you guys on, on, on how that works um, so we can, can get all that stuff uh, piped in the traffic and weather into the IFD. Um, Basically, we're going to send that position of flight plan information just like we normally do. And now the uh, portable device is now going to give us and the iPad our uncertified weather and traffic. Um, it is important for me to, to, to remind you guys that because that portable device is pumping out uncertified ADSB traffic and weather to a certified device, we cannot give traffic alerts from the IFD as if it were a certified traffic receiver such as the Skytrax 200, such as the NGT 9000. Those are certified devices and we can do traffic alerting. Um, because we're getting that from an uncertified device to a certified navigator, um, we can't do traffic alerts. So just, just I wanna set the expectation for that. So just, just so that nobody's uh, surprised. Um, I will say that the uh, improvement here for iPads is the Wi-Fi is now advertised as no internet. What that allows you to do is to use cellular data. So you don't have to shut off cellular data now if you're using the, uh, your iPad. So that's, that was a big one that was, that was requested a lot. Um, that was may have been causing some issues previously, but uh, that's all gone away now and we've uh, improved that connection. So uh, another one here is we've gotten rid of this message when you start it up. Um, and, and some of our folks on Avid Online have, Live had asked about that and they said, hey, can we get rid of this thing? Um, so what's gonna happen now is your existing setting, uh, when you shut down the IFD, like say your, say your Wi-Fi is turned on uh, and you have it set to the host network, you just got Leo Wi-Fi turned on, shut off the IFD, it'll persist through that power cycle um, and you won't see this anymore. It's just gonna remember the last setting that you had. Um, this didn't go completely away. You will still see this if, for example, you hold down the power button for a couple of seconds, like you're resetting your, your Wi-Fi module inside the IFD. Um, if you hold down the power button and then you let go, you will see this again, but you will not see this on, on regular startups. Uh, we did improve IFD 100 or the interface to IFD 100. Uh, now the app will get the airplane type from the IFD, uh, much faster connections and an improved uh, synthetic vision half screen. So um, there was something that I wanted to mention to you guys about IFD 100. Oh, um, if you've got 10.3, you can now use the IFD 100 10.3 app. Um, in previous uh, webinars, if you guys had ever seen me out at Oshkosh or Sun and Fun and I gave the IFD connectivity uh, class, um, I, I did talk about there's four different apps that we have. You know, we've got the IFD 100 10.2, 10.3, we've got IFD Trainer and Trainer XP, and this is what these different apps, and da, 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 you know, if you've got 10.3, you can delete your IFD 100 10.2. You just get rid of it, right? Um, IFD Trainer is now uh, part of what you use. So now 10.3, I'm sorry, IFD Trainer, um, it, as you're getting used to your new download, your, your new 10.3, if you've, you've got uh, shop time scheduled and that's on the, uh, in the near term, uh, now's the time to really get into IFD Trainer and, and start learning about that thing before 10.3 actually gets uploaded into your IFD. So 10.3, IFD 100 and Trainer, uh, is is uh, 
Good stuff. All right, so maintenance mode improvements. We did change the advisory notice on pin on the pin page. What that means is, well, here's what it looks like. Um, that used to confuse a lot of people when they go into maintenance mode and the message that was there previously kind of made it look like there was a pin that was already set, but nobody really knew what that was when in reality, the pin wasn't really set. It was just really confusing. So we changed this message around uh, just to make it a little bit more clear. You don't have to set a pin in maintenance mode. Uh, if you do, um, don't forget it. But if you do forget it, let us know. We'll send you a reset file. It's no big deal. But what that does is it allows you to lock down all your configurations so that someone doesn't go in there and inadvertently change something around and mess up your interfaces. So uh, we just changed that language around to make it a little bit more, more clear. Uh, now you can you can load up a CSV file to import user-defined waypoints. Before how we did this was you used to have to go hand jam each user-defined waypoint and it would live in the IFD. Well, now what you can do is now you can go and you can pull up uh, an Excel spreadsheet and you can start plugging away at your different user waypoints. And there's there's a way to do that. There's a process on how to do it. We'll have a webinar at it uh, at some point in the future. But if you want to learn about it, it's in the pilot guide. Uh, if you're using the five series pilot guide, it's chapter seven, four series pilot guide, it is chapter six. You can, guys, you can upload up to 500 different user waypoints from a single CSV file and load that up into the IFD. Uh, really, really, really cool feature. You're going to load that up in maintenance mode using the update tab. Uh, that's essentially what it's going to look like. Real kind of a brief overview of, of how that works, but uh, you'll have your, your waypoint name, what it is, and then of course a lat long uh, for that waypoint. Uh, up to 500, so really, really cool feature there. And then uh, enabling and disabling charts, RF legs, and VNAV in maintenance mode. I touched on this briefly earlier, but I'll get back into it. So in maintenance mode, in your new 10.3 maintenance mode config page, you'll have a couple of different things that you can enable and disable now. Uh, charts being one of them. Again, if you don't subscribe to a Jepson Charts database, you can shut that off so that you don't get the tab and you don't get the alerts that your charts are expired anymore. New calculations that we can change. Uh, RF legs, we, we uh, can enable and disable those depending on our, our uh, other aircraft equipment, if we can do RF legs. And then of course, en route VNAV, we can enable or disable that if we don't want to. All right, so uh, important to note, make sure that you verify these when you're upgrading your software uh, to 10.3 or your shop is upgrading the software to 10.3. I've, I've got APs, IAs, I know I got dealers in here. So make sure that you check that out uh, as you are upgrading these uh, these IFDs. And then of course, the ability to enable support for portable ADSB receivers to display on the IFD. I touched on that earlier uh, on, on how that information gets piped over, but uh, in maintenance mode, this is what that's gonna look like. And I want you guys to pay attention to the top left window. This is gonna be one of the last uh, maintenance mode pages that you'll see with the 10.3 upgrade, this wireless portables page. So if you do have one of those devices that sends wireless capstone uh, traffic and weather out to your iPad, to your different apps, um, and you want that to show up into the IFD, go ahead and enable that capstone under the wireless portables page. It's going to filter some of that stuff out. It's going to prioritize uh, which is more important. Usually, you know, your obviously your, um, your certified stuff comes first, but you'll allow it to uh, pipe that in as well. So if you don't have an ADSB receiver that is certified and you're just using a Stratus or a bomb or something like that for your traffic and weather, uh, we'll be able to take that in as well. So uh, we're, we're nearing the end. Uh, just to recap of what the software is going to look like, just some key features, visual approaches, VNAV, ADSB traffic and weather for portables, power lines, radar altimeter display over 429, map zoom, certified TAWS, and three arc second terrain data. That's all of that. But what I want to talk about now is how we're going to obtain the software, how we're going to upload the software, what we can do when we get it, and how all that stuff works. So Yesterday, what we did was we sent out this uh, knowledge base article as, as part of our announcement that we had it all certified. All right. Um, and how we're going to get that is that link is in this article, that IFD 5.4 software update uh, in the instructional video for loading. Um, read through all that. Watch the video. The request form is at the very bottom. 
we always recommend that you go see your Avidine dealer uh, to get these upgrades. We, we really do. We want you, we encourage you to go to your dealer. There's some protections there with, with warranty if something goes wrong um, that your dealer can provide you. Uh, we can't do that if you do that um, by yourself with your AMP or if you are an AMP yourself. Um, we do recommend that you see your dealer. You can do it yourself, but um, either way, we want you guys to go see your dealer. So that's one way to do it. The other way to do that is requesting uh, the software from Avidine.com using the knowledge base and, and clicking on this link as well. Um, so again, you get to that link, you scroll all the way down to the bottom and you click, uh, well, you read everything first as you're going down to the bottom. Um, and then once you get to the end of your article, uh, click there to request a 10302 software. If you scroll down a little bit further and if you're on a, uh, a phone, uh, you will see the attachments. That's where you see all of your pilot guides. It's in this it, It's in this article, the quick start guides, the pilot guides are all in that same article that we sent out. Uh, if you don't have the link, you don't know where to get it, just go to our knowledge base, go to avidine.com, click pilot support at the top. That's how you get to our knowledge base. Once you do that in the search block, just type in 10.3 and I guarantee it'll be the only article that shows up. So um, that's how you get to that. That's how you get to all of your information. Once you do that and you click that link, you're going to see this software request. And I know there's a couple hundred of you out there that have already seen this before. And how this works is this is the software request. It looks the same for dealers now as well. This is how we're capturing all the information about who's doing the downloads and who to contact should we need to get a hold of you for whatever reason. AD comes out, Service Bulletin comes out, we just need to get a hold of you. This is how we capture this information. In addition to the maintenance record on the last page of the software update service bulletin, which if you've done your software update already, you should have filled out and sent out to us. Um, so those are the two ways that we capture that information. As you're filling this out, you've got you've got to give us the info for your IP uh, APIA, the repair station doing the update uh, for your certified guys. Experimental guys, it's the exact same process. We still recommend that you go to your dealer for the update. Of course, we do understand that you can, as as the builder of the aircraft with the builder certificate, you can do these upgrades also. Uh, so the process isn't any different. What you would fill out in this case, if you're not using an AP or an IA or a dealer, um, then just let us know, uh, hey, this is experimental, this is my builder certificate number. Uh, hit submit and then uh, agree to all of those at the bottom and then you will then get your, your software package. Once you do get your software package, this is what's going to pop up. It's a Google Drive folder with a folder with required documentation, which is new for 10.3. We didn't do that with previous ones, but this is just a place where you can get your ICA, your AFMS and your STC for the software update, stuff that you guys need to have and make sure that you have uh, with any of those updates so that you've got that. It also has the release 10.302 training video, um, which allows you to kind of just, you, you know, it's a seven minute video on how to do the update, uh, real brief, but it also contains the service bulletin uh, that you will need to read and follow to a T to get this software update done, including the four um, load utilities, the run once conformity checker, full update and gold master files that you have to do, that you have to load onto your thumb drive. Make sure that those four DSF files are the only things that you put onto that USB stick when you do the update. Don't just download all, don't zip them, uh, just download them each individually. It's in the training video, watch the video on how I do it. Just download them individually and then drag and drop them into your USB stick as we get ready to do the software update. Watch the video, read the service bulletin. We're here to help guys, tech support is here. Uh, I'm here, if you run into any snags, you have any questions about your update, uh, that's how it's gonna get done. Um, it is a minor, uh, so, you know, AMP for your certified guys, experimental guys, you guys do what you want anyways. So um, uh, just make sure that you're doing the right thing, do what your certificate can handle, and um, uh, make sure that we are abiding by the uh, regulations, folks. That's, that's all we want you guys to do. So uh, that's how to obtain the software. Just real briefly, I wanna go over some resources for you guys, some training that's available for you guys uh, and other places to get your information from. Uh, AvidineLive.com is our uh, forum that we do have out there. Uh, it's it's customer driven. Um, a lot of us are on there. Our engineers are on there on a regular basis. Uh, I'm on there. 
uh, answering questions and stuff and, and interacting with you folks. So that's where we'll put out uh, company news. That's one of the places that we put out company news, new product info. Uh, we get all of your feedback on on updates here. So it, it's a great resource uh, to be social with with the folks that uh, work here at Avidine day in and day out from tech support, engineering, et cetera. We do have the Flying with the Avidine IFD uh, currently in its third edition, recently updated. That's available on Amazon.com. Scenario-based training that covers the 550, 540, and 440 uh, flavors of the IFD. Uh, Scenario-based training that you can follow along with your IFD trainer app, and that book is available on Amazon.com. Um, so that's where you will get that from. And of course, we do have uh, PDF versions available for that. And then on Amazon, um, the paperback version of that book. Um, some training videos, so the webinars um, are on there as well, but we do have some training videos and those follow along with the uh, the Michael Bauer book, Flying with the Avidine IFD. This is one of those things that uh, I think we're gonna update uh, as, thing goes along, as things go along uh, to make them match the third edition. Um, they're, they're still very much relevant, the, the videos that are available now as we update them um, and with the lessons that are in the third edition of the Bauer, of the Bauer books. So uh, not to worry about that, that's that's still plenty of good training, uh, but we will be updating them, just kind of freshening them up um, as, as time goes by. And, and we have uh, different software updates coming out. Uh, On-demand replay, so this webinar and all the other webinars that we have are available uh, on our main website under the on-demand replay, where be, you'll be able to, uh, to see this webinar and all of our future webinars um, under that tab. So that's one place that you can get them. We've also got them on YouTube. And uh, if you've registered to this webinar, you're going to get the webinar replay link. So uh, lots of different places that, that we can see those, those uh, webinars. Uh, another resource is our customer knowledge base. So again, I talked about the knowledge base. Uh, it's incredibly important. There's a ton of information there. Uh, that's how you're going to get your links for your pilot guides and all of your, your PDF documents out there that you can get. Uh, it's got information about warranty, how to activate your databases, how to download your databases, operational tips and tricks, some minor troubleshooting stuff, um, and, uh, and a bunch of other stuff. So we're always, we're always changing these knowledge base articles. We're always adding to them. It's a great resource. Uh, should be your first place to go, I think, uh, long before we do a Google search or, or we ask the general public, come, come to the knowledge base. We probably have a, an article already that may answer your question. And if not, reach out to tech support. And uh, if we don't have a knowledge base, we'll definitely get one going. Another resource is Gary Reeves. He's a master instructor. He's our national training partner, a uh, good friend of mine, great guy. He's on vacation right now uh, on a cruise in, in the Atlantic somewhere. But uh, uh, he's got a great book, Single Pilot IFR Pro Tips. Um, great guy, great, uh, great resource uh, for anything having to do with, uh, with mastery level single pilot IFR. Uh, with your IFD. So uh, give him a give him a, a visit over at pilotsafety.org. He's got a couple of classes for you over there as well. We have our IFD trainer app for iPad. If you don't have this already, uh, absolutely download it. It's free on the App Store uh, for your iPad. Um, it's modeled after certified flight code. It uses certified flight code um, as part of the emulation in there. So any any training that you do on uh, on trainer, you can then apply that um, and, and, and do the same buttonology over on your actual IFD. So it's a great way to, to sit from the comfort of your couch and, uh, and, and fly uh, a flight plan. So it's free on the App Store. There is a separate trainer app for X-Plane to, to interface that with your X-Plane, and it will emulate all six different versions of the IFD. So there is that. Again, social media, we're all over that. We've got two YouTube channels. We're on Instagram, we're on Facebook for the, uh, at the Ivadon Pilots Club Facebook page, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, we're all over the place. I'm one of the moderators on the Avidon Pilots Club, so I'm always in there answering your questions uh, and, and hanging out with you guys out there. Um, Instagram, we share a bunch of really cool stories there. And then of course our YouTube channels where this webinar will eventually live um, very shortly. And then all of our other training videos are available on there. We do have an Avidine avionics page and an Avidine tech support page. So if you're looking for uh, uh, company news and, and, and cool things going on there, that's going to be the Avidine avionics page. If you're looking for more uh, on the tech side, how to do certain things, um, the Avidine tech support page is where you're going to want to go to go check that stuff out. And just a reminder, all of our stuff is made right here in Melbourne, Florida. We've got some uh, some 
property up in uh, Concord, Mass, Westerville, Ohio, uh, but our headquarters is right here in sunny Melbourne, Florida, and everything is made in America. Everything's in stock and shipping right now. So with that, that concludes my webinar. I appreciate you guys. I hope I didn't take up too much of your time, um, but with that, I will open up the floor to some questions. Uh, I know Will and Frank have been uh, busy in the chat answering those. So if there's any questions that maybe we haven't answered, and it doesn't look like there's many at all that we haven't been able to answer, um, I'll leave it open for a little bit longer. If, uh, if we want to throw some other questions or, or Frank, Will, there's, you've got some uh, that you couldn't answer that maybe I could knock out, let me know. Hey there, uh, guys, and uh, good job there, Mike. One I saw that I don't quite remember uh, the capability of was, oh, I lost the question, Hold let me scroll down again. Here we go. Uh, Mr. James Curley was asking, is there a way of importing checklists instead of twisting knobs on the IFD? Currently, no, they still have to be um, manually entered. So the same the same way you've been doing it is is how it's going to be uh, with 10.3. We didn't change anything there. Let's see what other questions we got here. I mean, you guys are uh, you guys are on it today. All right. Let's see, how long will the update take? All right. So Peter, that's a great question. Um, uh, really. The service bulletin says it can take anywhere from uh, 45 minutes to an hour um, up to 90 minutes. Um, that that seems to be about right with the average being about 40 minutes. I mean, anecdotally, I've done about 27 of these updates uh, from from uh, previous versions, anywhere from 10200A all the way up to 10261 straight to 103. And um, as quick as 20 minutes and as much as 90 minutes, there's a couple of different factors there. Um, with the average being probably about 45, 50 minutes from from the time that I insert the USB stick to the time I finish my post accomplishment checkout, uh, about a, you know just just shy of an hour, 45 minutes tends to be kind of the average there um, for the update. And how long that takes? Uh, Valerie Milner, what uh, can you clarify again? What VNAV capability would be available on the 440, if any? Well, if you got a G5. You're going to see those uh, the VNAV deviations. Now, en route descent only is is the feature that we're bringing in. Um, so it's it's not a full on en route climb and descent VNAV. It is en route descent. So that's that's the um, that's what's going to be available. So on your 440, you've got something like a G5. You'll still be able to see those deviations on your G5. There's just no room. We don't have a VDI, a vertical deviation indicator, on the 440. Is there a data block that can display fuel remaining at destination versus just the next waypoint? If it's what I'm thinking of, yes. Uh, Mike, I think that's what, yeah, if it's what I'm thinking of, then then yes, a data block that can display fuel remaining at destination. Well, that's gonna be in your calculator for sure, right? Your fuel calculator. Uh, so I don't know if it's a data block, if it's definitely gonna be on, on the calculations page. Hey Mike, going back to the checklist question, um, yep. I think uh, you can once you once you go through the process of of knobbing in, you know, manually knobbing in, and you can also, I believe, use your Bluetooth keyboard, I believe, to program the checklist. Once you get it into the IFD, you can save it to a jump drive so that if you have a maintenance event or if you want to copy it to multiple airplanes, assuming they're like checklist. Sure. Uh, you can save and restore through the USB uh, jump drive. Uh, that's a good point, Tom. I appreciate it. Right. How much memory is required for the download? Um, are we talking about the USB stick? Or are we talking about on the IFD itself? Because it's going to dump everything. If if you upload software to the IFD, uh, in terms of the IFD, don't worry about it, right? Because it's it's going to it's going to dump and it's going to it's going to write over 
all those boards inside the IFD anyways. Um, as far as the stick itself, okay, there it is. Uh, yeah, for the stick, we recommend an eight to 16 gig thumb drive that can be formatted to FAT32. Um, so the Avidine thumb drive that comes with the IFDs is, is a perfect one. Uh, I do recommend formatting that each time that you do something, whether that be a, a database upload or a software upload, always reformat that guy. Um, there's nothing special about that USB stick. If you lose it, um, just head out to any big box store that sells USB sticks and just make sure that you're getting an eight or 16 gig thumb drive that you can format to FAT32. Um, so that's, that's what we recommend. Uh, do you, does it need eight gigs? No. Um, but that's just kind of the, the sweet spot in terms of commercially available thumb drives out there, right? Um, you know, they're prevalent. Eight gig thumb drives are, are prevalent. So that's what we recommend. If I haven't already updated to the previous update, must I update any previous updates prior to loading this update? Yes and no. If you have a 440 and you have a very old version of 440 software, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Tom, I think it's 10.1, but if you're running with 10.1, man, you haven't updated your IFD in a long, long time. Uh, most people around have 10.2.3.1 or 10.2.4.1 or 10.2.6.1. You can go straight to 10.3 from that. If you've got anything 10.2 and later, you can definitely go straight to uh, 10.3. Uh, and, and any flavor of 10.2, so 10.2.0, 10.2.0.0a, you can jump straight to 10.3, 10.2.3.1, right. 4.1.6.1, yeah. Let's see. Can you upload the checklist from the CSV file instead of typing in? Not the CSV file like you would uh, custom waypoints. XP trainer was not working well with an XP Cirrus with Integra IFD. Uh, hey Val, go ahead and uh, shoot us a message over at Tech Support. We'll we'll uh, we'll get into the the weeds of what's going on with uh, Trainer XP. If you haven't seen Tom's video on how to set up uh, Trainer XP, that's a good one as well. It's available on our YouTube channel. Um, so check that out and, and see if maybe there's some inconsistencies there. Uh, but if you continue to have issues, uh, just reach out to us. We'll be more than happy to help and uh, and work it out with you. How can we find which software version we have? Tom Goodwin, that's a good question. So uh, in that knowledge base article for the 10302 software update, right before the training video shows you how to find your current software level on, on your IFD. I can tell you the button knowledge, but it's right there in the knowledge base article, uh, AUX system, um, database or software status, you'll find it there, but uh, <clears throat> visually it's right there in the knowledge base article. Can you clarify the three arc second feature on the 440? So three arc second is a, uh, without getting too much into arc seconds, uh, basically what, what that is, it's a, uh, it's a clear terrain uh, visual on your screen, right? It's much, much clearer if you're looking at uh, synthetic vision. So I'm trying to find the slides here. I'll go back to what that looks like, kind of a side-by-side -side comparison of the current views. There it is. So here's, three arc or nine arc second on the left which is what you're used to seeing and then the three arc second hd terrain that's like golf right the lower number the better so three arc second on the right uh much clearer right uh more it's like more pixels really it's that's more, the best yeah. way it's yeah it's that, that's a good way to put it tom so more yeah more pixels more pixels there's, there's more data recorded when they did the scan of the terrain so it just gives you a higher resolution image so you can see the, the ridges of mountains will be a slightly sharper and more detailed. You may pick up a few bodies of water that wouldn't show up on nine arc second. Honestly, if you're in a, in a fixed wing airplane and you're not doing a lot of mountain flying, it probably isn't that interesting. We certainly did it primarily when we added TAWS and there's some helicopter operators that do a lot of obvious low level flying close to terrain, map of the earth stuff. And, and wanted the higher resolution. So for most fixed wing folks, not really required, but it's, you know, some folks just want to have it because it's cool, so. I think it's pretty cool. I'm getting it on mine, Tom. All right, guys. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, you guys are, uh, let's see. Oh, oh, 
And the three arc second update does not require a hardware change. Yes, it does, Eric. The three the three arc second HD terrain does require a hardware modification. So if you want that, um, it does have to come back. We've got to give it uh, some some beefier boards inside the IFD um, to to handle all that data that's coming in for the three arc second terrain. Uh, would you notify us when you have training videos available for visual approaches, Rick? Absolutely. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I'm going to do a webinar on that. Uh, where I'm going to touch heavily on on visual approaches. So uh, be looking out for that. Um, don't know when, but I know that's that's top of the list, man. That's going to be something that uh, it was very sought after. So I know a lot of people want to really get in the weeds of that. So that's that's top of my list personally for for webinars. So uh, maybe I, I recently sold my plane. I don't know if y'all know that, but uh, <laughs> um, I'm not able to hop on my plane to do the visual approach or, or, or all the all the videos anymore to go film. So maybe somebody out there has got an IFD they can let me uh, go up and, and and take some of these videos up. Um, anyways, um, guys, it was great. I'm gonna go ahead and end this here. You guys have been awesome. Uh, your questions are great. I hope you guys. Uh, Wish you guys the best of luck with your updates and with learning that. Get in IFD Trainer. Really learn about how uh, how 10.3 works. Uh, get into the books. All of those are available for PDF download. If you want the the paperback versions of any of those, they are available for purchase right now. Uh, but you can certainly go through and download all of those on PDF. Throw them on your your document section of ForeFlight. Um, just have them on your computer or on your phone or whatever. Uh, and all that stuff is readily available to you. So if you have any questions, feel free, uh, reach out to pilot support at avidine.com. Tech questions, go to tech support at avidine.com. Hit us up in the socials and the, in the uh, pilot club page, and we will definitely see you guys out in, uh, out in the world. So fly safe, fly avidine, and I will see you guys later. Have a good night, guys. Very good.